When you're very wealthy, you want to be part of the big boys. You want to be able to do the same vacations and make the same weddings. And if you see a dipping, it becomes a very intense pressure and very nerve wracking. So I, I don't think I think, it again, it helps when you have some flexibility. But I think once you cross a, th a certain threshold, I think it kind of has diminishing returns. Picture this. You're driving down the road and to your right, you see a brand new house popped up in the neighborhood. The house is probably worth five million dollars. The lawn is massive. They're paying their gardener no less than $40,000 a year. There's about seven different entrances into the home. You can't even see them all because they're actually four different lots combined into one. And you are jealous. Well, that's normal. Rabbi Joey Haber joined us. He was phenomenal. He's going to discuss affluence. He did not hold back. He wants you to rethink how you're currently thinking. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you so much, Rabbi Haber, for coming back into the studio. We had a short but stimulating conversation. It's 38 minutes in full. In addition to some ads, we have a brand new sponsor in the house. I'm actually wearing one of their shirts. More about them in the episode. Thank you, Twillery. And yeah, it's a phenomenal episode. I said that. Now it's your turn to listen and watch. Enjoy. Being a Jew? Awesome. Managing personal finances? Not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. I'm excited about this particular episode. We have HaChacham. When does someone become a HaChacham? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Joey Haver, how's that? Excited about this because we've watched quite a few of your videos online and I think you have a message. And this is an episode about money, right? We talk about budgeting, investing, and savings, and affluence, and this and that. But I'm sure from your viewpoint, you're seeing things that we probably haven't covered in a particular episode. So I'm excited to hear what what are you seeing out there as it relates to money, the challenges, and the opportunity. I find that like our uh, uh, being a from Jew, there's sort of so much. There's, there's so it's such a broad topic because you have so many challenges. Yet on the other hand, as a Torah Jew, we don't want to be about money, mm -hmm. and we want to be about spirituality and ruchaniyut and purpose. And then at the same time, our cost of living is ridiculous across mm -hmm. the whole scope of, broad, of orthodoxy. And there's pretty much why it's ridiculously high is for a few reasons. A, we all need to live together because we need to live near shuls. Mm -hmm. So which automatically, by definition, makes the cost of the housing and real estate go up. Kosher food is expensive. And we sent to yeshivas, which is tuition, which is high. So those three things automatically make the cost uh, very high. And then add to that the fact that we have um, Shabbat and we have weekdays, so you have different clothing and we're invited to so many different occasions, which requires us to spend more on those occasions. It just, all of it together becomes an intense topic. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's intense in regards to the struggle that so many people have. It's intense in regards to the opportunity that so many people have and the fact that we're all living together. So. I feel like the topic is incredibly broad. Do you find that some of it is self-inflicted? That if we were to take a good hard look at everything, that we can ease up some of that stress because we're purchasing things that aren't necessarily necessary? Do I think some of it is self-inflicted? I would say no. No. I would say that a lot of it is that our base is high. Mm -hmm. That means you could live in the middle of America, you could live in Kentucky, and you might be able to live easily on 50 grand. So it's wonderful, you can live that way. We can't. So our start off number is high. So what happens is that because of that, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to reach that number. And once you have a lot of pressure and then you start to earn that kind of money. So if a person earns $200,000, $300,000, don't tell him that he's still supposed to be tight. So now you could call it self-inflicted, but if a person out there worked really hard and is earning $300,000 and now you tell him he, now he says, if I'm earning that kind of money, I want to go out for dinner. Don't tell me I can't go out for dinner. Don't tell me I'm supposed to have $300,000 and I'm supposed to act poor. So I think the because our base is high and it takes a lot of pressure in order to get to that base, once you get there, you want to kind of feel like you have some flexibility. And so then you want to feel like you could do some of those nicer things. You want to say it's self-inflicted. You want a person to be able to earn $250,000 and still feel like he's living paycheck to check paycheck. He's not happy about that because the rest of America is living on 50,000 and they feel like they're wealthy when they're at 70 and he is making 250, which is incredibly successful. He wants to feel what success feels like. 
So you could call it self-inflicted, but I think it's human nature. We find, or at least when we look at the numbers, you have to be in the top two, three percent of income earners in America just to make it by as an Orthodox Jew. So there's a lot of merit to what you're saying when you look at the numbers. It's it's astronomical. I think a lot of people when they get married, they don't realize, you know, maybe they're getting support or things like it's that. It's a good thing that they don't realize. They don't you know <laughs> if they all realize what the cost was gonna be, we'd have a lot of problems with people getting married. You know, when you're talking about when I got married, I learned in Lakewood, right. okay, in BMG, we you know, we made eighty dollars a week. I, I bought a house in Forest Park, you know, Lakewood, Lakewood right, has yeah, the yeah. area of Forest Park. So back then, um, most of Lakewood was around the yeshiva. So there was this other side of the lake. No one really, very few people wanted to live on the other side of the lake. So they were opening up this new neighborhood on the other side of the lake called Forest Park. And they were having subsidized housing for $90,000. And I didn't want to do it. It was too far out. I said, there's no way I'm going to do it. After two months, I said, okay, let me do it. And... Next thing you know, we got, we moved into that house and it became, over time, that became like literally the central hub of Lakewood. That house today that we bought for 90 is worth over 500,000 today. Um, so I'm glad I didn't know. Because I think if we knew, if we understood it all, we'd be, we'd be so intimidated. And I wish less, fewer people knew. So let's talk about that. So growing up, children, how much should they know? How much should they not know? What, what are you seeing out there in terms of raising children as it relates to money because when they go to school they see certain things they they, they have pressures the same way adults have pressures it's, it's a real life so at some point they start realizing so i think it's really tough i i don't know, have a very clear answer to that i know that i grew up not really knowing i grew up in a simple neighborhood and in Deal, New Jersey, until you think Deal is very affluent, mm -hmm. that's in the summer. And the winter was right, it's a really, I live on a simple block, and, and we didn't know much. And I kind of feel like it helped because we weren't, we weren't like thrust into it right away. So I think it would be better if kids didn't realize right away. And then as it gets closer, I think they need to understand it more. But the reality of our community is that we're living on miracles. And that's why I say I think it's important that kids, when they get married, understand responsibility mm -hmm. and definitely understand needing to do what it takes, whether kill or not kill, they need to do what it takes. But I don't think they need to know every little nuance. Because I think if they knew every little nuance, and you know, I said the number 250, 300,000, them, I don't want to make that as if that's an absolute number. There are some neighborhoods in the firm world that you could live on 80,000, 100,000, 70. I'm not giving any mm -hmm. actual numbers. But in many, many neighborhoods, to have a full family requires numbers that are out of the league of a 22 year old who's trying to get married. So he shouldn't be thinking about it right then. Because, you know, on the last night of Hanukkah, I make these little videos sometimes. Mm -hmm. So on the last night of Hanukkah, I made a little video and I stood in front of the menorah and I said, I said, I was speaking mainly to the Syrian community. I said to every young adult who's who's afraid to get married, I said, I need you to look at those candles. You see how we celebrate on Hanukkah, we celebrate that one jug of oil lasted for eight nights. I see one of the reality. When you get married, when, you, when you're about to date, a lot of you are resistant because you think about the cost of tuition and the cost of housing and the cost of food and the cost of clothing and everything that you put it together and you're like, how am I gonna do this? And then since the Syrian, in the Syrian community, you know, it's kind of standard to have a, a high level car and have some housekeeping help and try to go to deal in the summer. And not everyone does, but a lot of people want to on camp and all that, like when you put it all together, it's really, really high. Mm -hmm. And because of that, a lot of you are afraid to, to date, I said, I want you to understand something. You see that miracle? The miracle of the lights? That miracle has nothing on what we've done. Our community is a community of people that are all immigrants. Either you're, you're an immigrant, your parents are immigrant, your grandparents are immigrant, your great-grandparents are immigrant. Go look up the average salary of immigrants. I don't know, it might be 30,000, 45,000, whatever the number is. I said, all of us, None of us makes sense. Your father doesn't make sense. Your uncle doesn't make sense. Your friend's father doesn't make sense. The house, the car, none of it makes sense. So all of it's a miracle. And the fact that we've gotten here is a miracle. A greater miracle than the miracle of the oil is the miracle of us. And the miracle of us being in this country and being able to buy homes and do whatever our lifestyle is, the whole thing is a miracle. So don't, you're scared because you're trying to dot every I and slash every T and figure it out every nuance. It doesn't work that way. Because if you would go and interview your uncle, who you think is doing very well, and you would say to him, what did it feel like when you get married, when he got married? And he would tell you, you know what, the truth is, I was selling a few things. I had no idea where it was going to come from. And then a miracle happened. 
And that's how it works. So I don't want you to know that much when you're getting started. I just want you to have the right mentality. If you're getting married, I want you to be focused. I want you to have a strong eth work ethic. I want you to, have to take responsibility. And if you have that, and you're real, you as the numbers grow and the needs grow, you'll hopefully you'll see some of those miracles. But we're all the miracles. Even the one of us that are struggling is a miracle because none of it makes sense. So the miracle of the lights is a small miracle compared to the miracle of us in this country. Wow. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but first, we have a new sponsor. And before I tell you who it is, I wanna tell you that it's no secret, I'm not a good dresser. I look schlumpy, my hair sometimes disheveled, many times actually, and I haven't bought clothing in years. And while that's economical, I also wanna look good. You can ask my mother. Clothing is not my forte. I'm also price conscientious, right? I don't want to buy something that A, won't last, and I also don't want to buy something that is too expensive. And I am not interested in spending my hard-earned money on dry cleaners. And that's why I'm excited to announce our newest sponsor. And let me show you this really cool intro. Transition. If you're watching on video, here we go. Guys, you got to look at this. If you're listening on the episode and you're not watching, you're missing a live presentation of this new shirt from Twillery. Check this out. When I go like this, there is this magical stretch material. It feels amazing, right? Now, I do have to lose a little bit of weight, and I went with a size lower rather than bigger for good reason, and it feels right. It feels like I'm actually muscular. I feel clean. I feel good. And I'm excited about it because we're moving into the summer months and we're going to have polos. I'm going to look fly, okay? You're going to see a new Ellie Langer. No more schlump, ma. You're going to see someone bedazzled in Twillery. Now, I have a promo code, okay? If you... Visit twillery.com slash kosher money. I'm going to get you $18 off. And get this, the promo code CHAI, C-H-A-I, okay? $18 off your sale. Description, check it out. All the details, $18 off your purchase. First time, if you've purchased Twillery, then you don't get this promo code. But you've already gotten the benefits but you really got to check it out. <clears throat> Feel that, Yaakov, you hear that? Zero. You hear zero. It just feels good, okay? So I am a big fan of Twillery. I've gotten their clothing before, but here and there. I wasn't a dresser, but now I'm a dresser. Now I feel good. You're going to see me walking down the street. You're like, hey, is that Linger? Oh, no, he's dressed too good. Oh my gosh, it's Langer. Twillery.com slash kosher money. Use promo code chai. Then they'll know that we pushed you there and you're going to thank us. Enjoy. Now back to this week's episode. I want to talk about affluence, right? It's almost like a double-edged sword because it can provide tremendous opportunity, but it has challenges, right? And I think people who are struggling think that people who are affluent have it all made, but really there are tests and unique challenges as it relates to affluence. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of affluence out there. What comes to mind? What what what, so what are those opportunities? I want to give you a thought on this, what you just said. You know, I was once went on a Bar Mitzvah trip to Israel, and a lot of the members of the trip were pretty affluent. And one person told me, he says, I, I want to tell you what I tell my son. And I thought the lesson was so good. This might have been six or seven years ago, but I still remember it vividly. He said, I tell my son, you know, in some of the communities, there's some a lot of wealth. I said, look at the houses. You see the houses? Looks fantastic, right? And in your mind, you're, you're imagining all kinds of things. Wow, this person must be so happy. Life is so unbelievable. He says, when you look at a house, all you know about them is their house. You know nothing about what's happening inside of the house. You don't know the relationship the mother and father have. 
You don't know the stress the father is under. You have no idea the pressure. You have no idea what their financial status is even today. You just know about what it was when they bought the house. You don't know what the relationship is with their children. You don't know what what kind of addictions their children are involved in. You don't know the relationship that they have with You don't know how happy they are. You don't know what's on their mind. You don't know their mental health. You don't know their physical health. You know nothing about them. So our brain has this tendency to look at a house with a really, really inset driveway with a gorgeous lawn and know there's a beach and a pool and a tennis court and a basketball court in the backyard and you see gorgeous hedges and you say, wow, if I would live in that house, life would be perfect. It's not true. Life, and I'm not even going from a religious level, and I made up this number a few weeks ago and you might disagree with my number, but in order to have a happy life, you probably need 15 things. And you'll tell me if you agree with my things. Go ahead. Um, number one, you want to be healthy. Number two, you want to live a long life. You could be healthy and not live long. You could live long and not be healthy. Number three is you want your family members to be healthy. Because if you're healthy and you have a fa close family member that's not, then your life isn't so good. That's one, two, and three. Number four is you want to have a good job. Number five, which is not necessarily number four, is you want to have a good income. So far, you agree with the first five? Yeah, go ahead. Good. Number six, you want to be married. You want to have a spouse. Number seven, which again is not necessarily linked to number six, is you want to like that spouse. Correct? Not automatically did it go hand in hand. Number eight is you want to have children. Number nine, you want to have good children. Number 10, you want to have good children that you get along with. Again, those three things are not automatically all together. So we gave you three in regards to health, two in regards to income, two in regards to spouse, and three in regards to children. That's 10 things. Then number 11 is you want to be respected. Because if you have all that and no one respects you and appreciates you, you don't like life that much. Number 12 is you want to be relevant. And you want to feel like you're in the game and you feel like you're part of it and people know you and recognize you and appreciate you and, and you're, you're kind of in it. Number 13 is if you have all of the 12 things I just said, but your life is full of stress, you're not that happy. So you can have wonderful marriage and kids and all that, but you're stressed out all the time. You're not that happy. Number 14 is that if you have everything I just said, you could feel like you have nothing if you're jealous. So you want to have a lack of jealousy. And then number 15 is that you could have everything I just said, parent, children, wife, spouse, business, jobs, all that. But if you don't have peace, peace with your brothers, peace with your neighbors, peace in your, within your business, then you also, life is brutal. So I just gave you 15 things that every single person wants to have. When I see the outside of your house with the pretty lights reflecting off of your long windows and your gorgeous doors, all I know is maybe the answer to one of those things. I don't know anything else. So I think like affluence to some degree and is a fraud because you know one piece of the story. You don't know the whole story. I was waiting for number 16 being a massive car. Just a beautiful, you know, like <laughs> once we get it from the needs to the wants. I thought we're not only talking to Syrians. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting. I mean, a lot of people don't think that through. They see someone with a nice car, nice house. They think happy, right? Correct. And, and as much as we say it and cover it and people hear it throughout their youth, money does not make you happy. I do think that money contributes to happiness. Contributes. And I'll say this. Um, if you ask me the sweet spot is comfortable, meaning that if a person can't pay any of their bills, it's very hard to be relaxed and calm and happy. When you look at a gas bill and you feel like they're going to turn off your gas or the school is calling you about the tuition and driving you crazy, um, it's difficult and it definitely affects your happiness. So I think being comfortable, and in fact, I think there was a study somewhere, maybe the New York Times years ago, that said like $70,000 up to $70,000 a year contributed to happiness. Now, that's not for a religious Orthodox Jew. Our number is probably higher. But up to $70,000, they found, you know, it's going from 50 to 60, 60 to 70 contributed to happiness. But then after that, it didn't keep rising. So what happens is once you get past comfortable, you say, okay, well, so if I'm comfortable and I have some flexibility, so having more flexibility is going to be great. But that's not true because once you become extremely wealthy, then there's a tremendous amount of pressure that comes along with that. Because now all of a sudden, you know, if one person is worrying about how am I going to pay my $372 gas bill, it's pressure. But if another person is worried about my real my building in, in Manhattan, the city going down from $200 million to $100 million, that's a $100 million loss. 
that pressure is so much more intense. $372, you're going to figure out how to get it somewhere or another. Losing $100 million is, is a wild pressure. So I think, uh, you know, the strong affluence that even though it looks great because you go on vacations and private jets and all that, I think there's a tremendous amount of pressure that's associated with it. And I, I think that that almost takes away from the happiness. I'll give you a little example. There's a doctor um, that a lot of us use in the Syrian community in Brooklyn. His name is Dr. Fadiwa. He's just, he's the most wonderful man in the world. He's working. I don't know if I have a Syrian person work as hard. He's like from 3 a.m. till 1 a.m. every single day, nonstop. I'm not exaggerating. Runs home, eats, sleeps uh, for an hour. He and... sleeps a couple hours and then wow. he's back in the office. Oh, I'm really not exaggerating. Maybe it's 4 a.m. and 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. So he maybe sleeps for two and a half hours. The only night he gets sleep is Friday night. Mm. Um, so one time I was in his office and I like to ask these questions a lot because I'm always interested in what's going on with people. And I said to him, I said, doctor, this is maybe 10 years ago. I said, do you give out more um, anxiety pills and antidepressant pills than you used to? He says, he says like way more. He says way more, 10 times more. He says, all the wealthy people you know, all your friends, all the wealthy people, they're all on it. And the truth is thinking about it, I understand. Because if one person just figuring out, can I afford another car or not? It's one pressure. But if another person, I mean, I just read recently, I don't know if this is true, that in 2022, Elon Musk lost $200 billion. He's the first person in the history of the world to lose $200 billion. So think about that for a second. Everyone in America wants to be Elon Musk. He's the man today, right? Him and Jeff Bezos, they are the men. And yet, Elon Musk lost $200 billion. So what do you think his year was like? You think it was a party? Or you think his year was a tremendous amount of pressure? Now, I understand he's still worth well over $100 billion, So you might say, oh, give me his problems. No, it's not true. You would you could be able to sleep at night if your net worth was going on. It's also all public and everyone knows. So when you're very wealthy, you want to be part of the big boys and you want to be able to do the same vacations and make the same weddings. And if you see a dipping, it becomes a very intense pressure and very nerve wracking. So I, I don't think I think, it again, it helps when you have some flexibility. But I think once you cross a, thir a certain threshold. I think it kind of has diminishing returns. Right. Everything in moderation. Right. Too much relevancy. Number 13. Right, yeah, too on much. The, uh, Rabbi Haber's Bible over here is uh, <laughs> too much. But this is very interesting. I think this is the start of a book, possibly. If you ever did want to go in the direction, you can, you know, you have 15 chapters right here. There might be something to it. Wow, it's an interesting one. People are, okay, I like this. Okay. <laughs> people are going to reach out and say, hey, Rabbi Haber does videos. He sends them out. How do, how do I get access? Is that just like a private for the kahila? How, how so that's a work? good question. I mean, we uh, first of all, every week, or almost every week, we're on I Torah and Torah anytime. Okay. It's the same shir on both of them. Great. And then um, the truth is when we put out little videos, I just send them out there. And there's actually in the Syrian community, there's something called SY Alerts and they post the video. Oh, post it. And I I think at some point I have to consolidate and put it all under one platform. Uh -huh. And hopefully we'll work on that in the coming months. But right now it's I Torah and Torah anytime that are the easiest way to get it. What's your message to the people that are struggling? Granted, getting $372 for a gas bill is a bit easier than losing or trying to make up $200 billion, but there are people that are not able to make ends meet, and they do rely on on charity and gemachs and things like that, where putting two pieces together is is, is a struggle for them. And so, I'm sure you've seen that So I want to. The truth is we spoke a lot about affluence. Right. And I think we're speaking, when we're talking about affluence, we're talking about maybe 5 to 10%, even very comfortable to wealthy, 5 to 10% of our communities. Mm -hmm. I think a vast majority are under the struggle category. And I don't know if we spoke about it enough because that's really what most, most people that are going to watch this or listen to this are experiencing that, where you know they're earning a nice income, they're working hard, and whatever number they're making, again, I feel bad that I mentioned the number before, whatever the number they're making, and within their communities, it doesn't do it. So let's say the number is $150,000, and that really is a wonderful thing. Um, but that's a wonderful income, but it really does, if it, in his community, it could really not work. So I think the first thing they need to realize is that a vast majority of our firm community is probably more in that category than the one we've been talking about till now. And the problem is that the person who's very affluent kind of gets the most attention. So if you live in a community and there's 150 gorgeous homes, people recognize those 150 gorgeous homes, but they're not stopping 
to also appreciate that there's probably 3,000 normal homes. So don't, first thing you need to do is don't think that everyone there is wealthy besides me. You need to realize that, you know, when you get stuck in traffic and you know that everyone's in traffic, you kind of get comfortable that everyone's in traffic. This is the way life is supposed to be. Yeah. So if you realize that like a lot of us are in the same category and a lot of the Jewish people, a lot of the from communities in the same category, then I think that automatically makes it somewhat easier. That this is a universal issue. Um, what do we do about it? Is that your next question? I, I think it's hard to really say because I don't can't, you know, there's a lot of people would say, you know, people have these lofty ideas like, oh, we should change the tuition crisis or we should figure out the food crisis or the housing crisis. I've yet to see one person ever move the needle one inch on any of those issues at all. Housing is just, no one controls it. We're in a neighborhood. There's a certain amount of square miles that everyone wants to live in. And there's more people and there's fewer homes. Supply and demand, the price goes up. No one's going to make a Takana. Houses could not be over $300,000. It's just, it's not happening. And the same thing is true with food. It just, there's a cost. And and the same thing is true with tuition. Again, a lot of people have tried and and maybe in neighborhoods that if you don't care about the secular education or if you don't care, if there's a part of the education you don't care about, then maybe it could be cheaper. But if you're from a community that really cares about both secular and Judaic education, then that's, it's going to cost a lot. There's no really, no way around it. A quick break from this week's episode to tell you about approved funding. You've seen Shmuel Shaiwitz here in the studio many times. I am coming back on camera to tell you how phenomenal of a person he is. Yes, he works in the mortgage industry. Yes, approved funding is practically a bank and they cut out the middleman. And if you need a mortgage, he's your go-to. But so many people have been reaching out to him. He's now part of the Living Smarter Jewish family, giving advice to people people who may or may not want to get into the real estate game and they have questions about how it works. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal person to have in your Rolodex. Shmuel at approvedfunding.com. You can also visit approvedfunding.com slash mortgages. I believe you can even visit approvedfunding.com slash kosher money. He's been a great friend of the podcast and he plays the long game. He's smart about that and how he builds his contacts. If you are facing a particular financial quandary and you need a resource, you can reach out to him. And he's very, very honest. If he's not able to help you, he'll tell you. He takes the time to speak to people. And he's smart because when you play the long game, you build relationships and relationships lead to uh, business. And from there, um, bigger and better things await. So I'm excited about this partnership. I think we've done, how many episodes, Yako, have we done with Shmuel so far? 20? 30? I don't know. I, I, I've, I've lost uh, track. He spoke at our, at our event. We're going to do more events, and Shmuel will be speaking. Um, really excited. Um, Approvedfunding.com slash mortgages. We're going to put his contact in the show notes. Reach out to him. You'll be surprised. And now back to this week's episode. Are there any movements within the Sephardi community for out of town? Or I know at least with the Ashkenazi communities, you can move to Cleveland, Cincinnati. So it's a great question. So first of all, there are movements also to address the tuition crisis. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely um, a few different, uh, you know, agendas that are working on it. Will they succeed? I don't know. Only time will tell if it's really something that's plausible or doable. And then as far as moving out of the community, there actually is a new thing over the last three, four years. It really got strong during COVID mm -hmm. that there are young families that are moving to deal. Now you think deal is an affluent community. Right. Like I said, in the winter, it's more of an easier way to live. And this, it's spread out. So you can live in certain neighborhoods where the housing is not ridiculous. Um, I think the schools give breaks faster. And the pressure is just lower because, you know, your, your kid's not in a wedding every night. They're not in a school that everyone's trying to keep up with the Joneses. So that has helped a lot of people. And it also allows them, a lot of them really like to be in deal in the summer. So if they're in deal in the winter, it allows them to be in deal in the yeah. summer. And there are some people who'd rather give up um, Brooklyn in the winter than give up deal in the summer. Interesting. So in the Syrian community, yes, people are moving to deal. And a lot of them are saying that one second, the quality of life is incredible because it's calmer. I'm not invited to as many things. I'm not running. I could park my car. I could go home at night and sit in my house and it's a fairly big house. It doesn't cost as much. Just life is simpler and they appreciate that. One of the reasons we do see a lot of or feel a lot of pressure in our communities is because what you call these classless societies, classless in the sense that someone who's not Jewish, who lives in a particular area, 
is very similar to his neighbor. They they can afford potentially the same things. There's a reason they all live together. In our communities, given our needs uh, for proximity to a synagogue, where you know you can have one person who's making a million dollars a year, and then you can his next door neighbor might be making one hundred fifty thousand. And thereby, you know, what they can afford is different. When you when you think Father, about it, just to stop yeah. you, do you realize that we just called someone who's making one hundred fifty thousand dollars as if he's in the lower right. end? Right. That is like it's so unfair right. because you think about so many people out there that are making fifty, sixty, seventy, and it's also a struggle. So it's it's just unbelievable right. how you know when you talk the lower end, you gave a person on the lower end, someone who anywhere else outside of our square blocks. Right would be a wealthy man. Right. He'd be coming back to his high school graduation with his attache case and his one and a half suits and his a picture with his wife and his kid, one and a half kids and a dog and be so proud of himself. Like he <laughs> is the success of the class. And here you used him as an example of the lower <laughs> right. end. So that's sort of what we're dealing with. So yes, I think the fact that we have a classless society, well, I don't like the way that sounds. Yeah, right. Classes, we're classless when you first society. said it in the intro call, I, I was like, Wait, we, we're pretty classy. Yeah, we're classy. So I think, but the idea of the fact that we have a society where everyone lives together is a beautiful thing, but a difficult thing. And and almost every religious Orthodox neighborhood is like that. Um, I think it's beautiful because it's important that, you know, you don't want the kids who have affluence to be too uppity and too cool. And you don't want the kids that are struggling to feel like to be too distant. And and the beauty of our community from a financial standpoint, again, there's so much other beauty about our community in terms of purpose and value and ruchaniyut and Torah and so that's the real beauty. But the beauty of our community, even in terms of re regards to money, is the fact that there's so much opportunity and that no kid is stuck. And I think one of the miracles, I told you before that it's a miracle where, where so many of us have gotten to, one of the miracles is the fact that we're so close to each other. So if you take a random kid in Omaha, how many people does he know? Yet if you take a random kid in our community, they're well connected mm -hmm. to a lot of people that could help them really succeed. So if you look at our community, the Syrian community, a lot of the success has happened through, uh, you know, through just my uncle gave me a job, he started me off, and then I went to someone else's community, and then I opened up my own division, and then I went out on my own, and not, not not everyone's going into their father's business. That whole thing is a myth. That's 30 years old of not being there really anymore. Once upon a time, we all had it. Now almost no one does. Um, but the, even though I did, I went to my father. My father's a rough and I became a rough. So I guess I went into my father's business. But most of us um, don't do that. And But you're still connected to people who can give you a lead, who can give you a head start, who can give you a chance. And I think that's what enables, that's part of the miracle of how we've gotten here. So I think the fact that we live together is a, is a beracha. It's a beautiful thing. It allows those that have more to understand those that have less, those that have less to appreciate those that have more, to enjoy each other's company. So I think there's a lot of fantastic things, but it does create a pressure. So I would say the first thing is a kid needs to realize that when you're raising your children, they need to realize that A, nothing stays this way forever. So don't think that just because you can't afford it now, it means you're never going to be able to afford it. In fact, um, we read in the parasha a little while ago that Yaakov Avinu, excuse me, Yosef sent to his father Yaakov um, agalot wagons. So now she says, why do you send wagons to his father to show him to remind him of the last thing that they were learning? The Shem is Shemuel says something different. He says he's sending his father wagons to send a message to his father. I got it, because you know I got it. I got it means I understand the message and the values of the way we live. What is that message? The wagon, the wheel. Because what's the wheel? I know I'm on top right now, Yosef is saying, but I know easily I could go back down. And I'm never getting too high. And the same thing, we're now going down to Egypt. We're going to go into exile. This is not good. We're going down. But like a wheel, it's going to go right back up. So the message of the agalot is the wheels, the wagons, and the wheels of the wagon. The message of it is the life is that way. And I think every single one of us need to educate our children on that. That even if it's a struggle right now, it doesn't mean it's staying that way. And even if someone, your neighbor looks like it's so wealthy, it doesn't mean it's staying that way. And none of us can get too up and too down. To say that, you know what, the wealthy person should tone his life down and he should have, live in a smaller house. It's a wonderful thing, pie in the sky, you're never getting it done. Again, it's just, there's certain things that are just part of reality. So you're not, there's no, I, I don't know in the history of man that you've ever had that wealthy people all agreed to live 
and a lower lifestyle. You might get a few of them that are really altruistic, but for the most part, you're not getting them to do it. So, But instead, what we could train our children, both the wealthy and the not so wealthy, and the ones that are really struggling, is to realize that life's a wheel. And if you look at life as a wheel, you understand that the up is an up, and, and there's opportunity out there from a financial standpoint for everybody. You talk about the, the person making a million dollars, and for all we know, half of it's going straight to charity. There's a tremendous amount of charity being given. And if someone is to give a half of his net worth to charity every year, you know, is there is there a halacha against living on the rest of the money somewhat lavishly, right? Like, I think we shouldn't necessarily look at those who are wealthy as as if they're holding on to that money. We're, I just want, so I much- want to cut what you're saying right out and just say this. You don't know anything about what that person is doing. What he's doing with his money, what he's not doing with his money, what his reason is, what his purpose is. The whole conversation, I don't mean to say it like that, well, abroad, but I'm saying the whole conversation of he's doing this with his money, he's not doing that with his money. I don't know what's justified or what's not. And every, any person who's struggling say, well, if I had that kind of money, I'd be so much more modest with it. Sure. Mm-hmm. Because you know what happens when a person is successful? It, again, it's human nature and we shouldn't be this way. But when a person is successful, they're like, they kind of like people to know about it. And that's just how it is. And anything, and if, if you're if you're successful in 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 you know in, in in chesed, you like people to know that you do a lot of chesed. And if you're successful in having raising wonderful children, you like people to know about your wonderful children. So when a person is successful, they they're kind of proud of their success. So uh, it's just human nature is to to be a little bit I don't want to call it boastful. But to be proud and the answer being I could do it and why should I really not do it? And even if I build a smaller house, it's not the next guy's still not gonna build a smaller house. So again, there are some people that are really good at this. And it's so inspiring and it's so wonderful that there are people that are really modest. I remember going to a person who's clearly a very wealthy person and probably and it went to his son's bar mitzvah and it was so simple. This man has given money to other people to make a bar mitzvah with charity that was nicer than the one he made for his own son. Wow. And I thought that was incredible. But most people aren't like that. It's and hard. don't and in life you could bang your head against the wall and say what everyone should do, tuition should be less, housing should be less, people shouldn't be so proud, and people shouldn't be egotistical. You could bang your head against the wall and frustrate yourself from now to the rest of your life. Or you could just kind of find the answer and find the door of where, what you can do about it for your own lifestyle and focus on that. We'll be right back to our episode of Kosher Money. But first, Kol Chabad. You've heard about them. They've been around since the 1700s. If you go to the Kosel, if you go to the Kotel, if you go to the Western Wall and turn around, someone actually sent me a photo this week of their, I believe it's a soup kitchen that you see. Um, it says Kol Chabad. And then he went somewhere else. He saw another sign of Kol Chabad. They're everywhere. They're across Israel, and they're helping Israel's neediest. So if you have miser money, if you have charity money, if you have extra money, and you want to make sure it goes to a good place, Kol Chabad is that place, okay? Visit kolchabad.org slash kosher money. Your dollars go to an amazing, amazing organization with very low overhead and your dollars go uh, a really far away. So widows, orphans in need of shelter, clothing, food, really, really, really special organization. And that's why they are a partner of ours in this endeavor. We don't take on everyone. We've gotten dozens of requests of sponsorships. We have limited sponsorships, but there's a reason we took Kol Chabad on because we believe in their mission. So check out the show notes, click on the link, give something. It could be eight bucks. It could be a dollar. It could even be one million dollars. They'll take one million dollars. If you give what if you give one million dollars, I promise we'll do one of those big checks, right? Where you'll we'll actually do this little bit. We'll come into the bank. We'll try to cash it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Let me know if you bid or donate unlimited bids. You, As many people that want to donate a million dollars, they told me it's fine. They can accept it. Okay? And now back to this week's episode. What would be your closing remarks? Something we didn't necessarily cover as it relates to money. There's so much. I mean, we could probably sit here for hours going through. You have pages of notes, and we would only be scratching the surface. Again, I have so many different thoughts. My closing remarks would be this. Our lives are very much, and I think this is important. I don't know, I don't think I, I, I don't think I spoke, mentioned, talked about this enough just now. Our lives are completely dictated by Hashem. And Hashem gives, creates the challenge, creates the test, 
and creates the beracha. And we have to always live in that realm. So when you see the person do something and egotistical about it, and they just made, you know, your daughter comes home and she tells you about her friend that just made an extension on an already big house. And you're like, I could just picture that girl. And she's like talking with a nose in the air. And you're like, just so frustrated by it. Stop. I say, Hashem runs the world. And Hashem's the one who put this here. And right now, if I am affluent, Hashem wants me to be affluent. And then I need to think about and focus on what am I supposed to be doing with that affluence. And if I'm struggling, that means Hashem wants me to be struggling. And I have to think about what I'm supposed to create and how I'm supposed to grow through that struggle. We as a nation did not become great from all of the easy times. We became great through the difficult times. Because, you know, memories are created in easy times. But legacies are created in difficult ones. So when we think about our grandparents, we think about sacrifices that they made and struggles that they went through. So when you're going through a struggle, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to inspire your children. There's an opportunity to show a higher level of emunah. And I know a wealthy person needs emunah too. But when a person really feels a struggle, then you have an opportunity and that that's so so great. So don't be frustrated about it, even though it's human nature to be. So I don't blame you. But then you, we have to hold catch ourselves and say, one second, Hashem put me right here. And there's something incredible about being right here. Not incredible about tomorrow when I'm going to make it big. Right now, there's something incredible about being right here. And if we can embrace the right here and appreciate the right here, we can realize how much is in control. I'll give you one last little story. <laughs> My wife and I went on a vacation a few weeks ago, and we like to talk a lot on the vacation and talk about Hashem and whatever. So I was talking to my wife and said, you know, talking about all that happened and the amount of speeches we're giving today and how much is out there. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, it in order to get to this place, yes, we worked very hard and we prepared a lot, but the whole thing, it was 12 different miracles to get us to this spot. And I don't have time to tell you all 12 and it'll be boring, but I'll just tell you one. And I'll conclude with this little story. So I was learning Colel in Lakewood, right? My in-laws helped us a little bit. My wife had a job and I was making what Lakewood BMG makes, which is $80 a week. And anyhow, I'm learning Lumbus, teeth, the whole thing. Now my wife has a good friend. Her friend's husband is a regular working man. So he keeps asking me, he says, Joey, could we learn once? Could we learn once? And I'm like, I keep pushing him off. I'm like, he's not on my level at all. I'm learning Reb Chaim's and Rajbas and, you know, Kivegas and Baruch Beres. I'm not like going to learn with this simple guy who doesn't have the same kind of issue with background. Finally, after a few months, my wife, and his name is Morris. My wife tells me, he says, Joey, just learn with Morris one time. He really wants to learn with you. Make him feel good. So one afternoon in, 20, in 2001, one Shabbos afternoon, an hour and a half before Mincha in deal, I was staying by my in-laws' house and deal in the summer. I, I learned with him for an hour and a half. Wonderful. We learned an hour and a half together. We learned fantastic. Um, two months later, Rabbi Miller passes away. And at Rabbi Miller's Leviah, Morris is driving in a car on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn with his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law's name is Daniel. Okay? Daniel happens to be my first cousin. So Daniel tells Morris, as they're driving Ocean Parkway at the Levaya, he says, you know, I really want to start a class, a, a shiur in my house one night a week. He says, but I don't know who to get. So Morris says to Daniel, why don't you just get your cousin? He says, which cousin? He says, Joey Haber. He says, Joey Haber. He says, Joey Haber's not the type to give a class. Like, he doesn't know how to do that. Morris says, I just learned with him in the summer, and I'm telling you, he could be good. As they're talking... They stop at a red light on Ocean Parkway. I'm crossing the street. Daniel gets out of the car and goes on, you know, there's like a side lane where you're walking lane. He gets out of the car and he just sees me. I didn't realize what had happened. And he said, Joe, would you want to give a class in my house on Tuesday nights? I said, that's funny. I was thinking about maybe potentially starting to do something like that. I said, okay, let's talk again. But I, I could be, I'll be willing to do it. And two months later, right after 9-11, I started the first class. Every single shear I've ever given since then is all a product of that class. I gave that class in his house to five, six people in deal in the winter on Tuesday nights. And 
Maybe there would be seven people or eight people, maybe 12 when it was really rolling. I prepared 10, 12 hours for every single one of those shiurim. And over time, then I went into shuls and then other shuls, then it was recorded, da 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 And then I said, honey, it just happened because I learned with Morris on a Shabbat afternoon in the summer, one-on-one. Without Morris, there's no Daniel. Without Daniel, there's no Joey Haber. So the whole thing is a miracle. And we have to stop and recognize any person who feels any level of success, if they're honest with themselves, they could realize that it's a miracle. So if right now, in a certain area, Hashem wants it to be a struggle, then that's also His miracle. Because I want to give you one last little thought. Go ahead. Okay? We, it says in the, in the, in, in Ashre, when we say Ashre, there's one, it's in the letters, it's in the order of the Aleph Bet. There's one letter that's not, doesn't have a Pasuk. And that's the letter Nun. Says the Gemara, why is there no Nun? Because Nun for, refers to Nofel, which is falling. And therefore, we don't have a Nun. There's no Nun in there. How, how is a Nun shaped like this? It's a half a circle. That means you don't understand the whole concept of how it goes up and down. If you're in that half a circle, then you're falling. But the Gemara says, the next Pasuk brings it back in. Somech Adonai Lechol HaNofelim. It puts the word nofel, but it starts with the somech. What's a somech? The samach. What's a samach? A circle. That it's around like a wheel. So if you just see half the picture, and if you're just in the nun world, and you see half the sphere, then that's falling. That's You're going to have frustration all over the place. But if you can see the full circle, then you realize that life goes up and down, and that's the blessing. Nun and here's samach. my final thought. Nice. How do you spell miracle? What's the miracle in the Jewish people? It's nes. Right. Nun samach. Following the nun, you just see the circle. So every one of us, no matter where we stand on the financial ladder, needs to recognize the message that Yosef sent his father. I get it. I get that even though I'm the king of Egypt, it doesn't mean anything. And even though we're coming down to Egypt and you're coming down to Egypt, it doesn't mean it's going to last. And if we have the right mentality, I think that's the best way that all of us can feel a sense of blessing in our lives. Goosebumps. Our thanks to Morris, Daniel, yeah. Jeffrey, yes. Leon, everyone who brought us together uh, throughout the journey. This has been incredible. Looking forward to having you again soon. Thank you so much, Rabbi Haber. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Kosher Money. If it's your first time here, welcome. We have 50 plus other episodes in our YouTube and Spotify and Apple podcast playlist enjoy it a lot of our practical episodes are maybe not as enjoyable but they'll give you the tools you need to conquer that part of your finances thank you to our friends living smarter jewish a division of the ou visit livingsmarterjewish.org if you need a financial resource they can hook you up with an advisor they can answer your questions if you have crippling debt go to them speak to them there are amazing people out there that will help you at no cost to you how awesome is that right welcome to 2023 you're listening to this in the year 2028 and i believe living smarter jewish is still around although now they have a jerusalem headquarters headquarters as mashiach has come thank you to our friends at mishpacha they're covering bonus content questions we did not ask our guests in their magazine visit mishpacha.com for more bonus content thank you to our sponsors thank you to approved funding dot com slash mortgages thank you to our friends at kolel chabad a very special man in california sponsored these ads he wants more people to know about kolel chabad so visit kolelchabad.org slash kosher money and give a donation even a small donation goes a long way you can do a five dollar recurring donation someone popped on there recently gave thousands of dollars um, you don't even have to be jewish you can sponsor people in need in Israel, they need food, shelter, clothing, regardless of what religion they're in, what color their skin is, um, what their level of religiousness is, your money goes to help. They have soup kitchens. They, they provide so much um, for widows and orphans. Kolchabad.org slash kosher money. And bum, ba, bum, our newest sponsor, Twillery. I have clothing. I want to show it off. I'm excited about it. You can get $18 off your first purchase at twillery.com slash kosher money. We're going to put the link in the show notes. Okay. Your first purchase of $139. Subtract $18 off the top. 
because you are a first time purchaser and you're going to be happy. The clothing feels clean. It feels good. It feels the way clothing should be in whatever century we're currently living in. So visit twillery.com slash kosher money. Use the promo code chai so they know your friends at kosher money sent you. Thank you so much for listening. If it's your first time, subscribe, follow, listen. I, I always wonder who listens this far into the outro, but I appreciate it. I would imagine 95% of people want to run away. You know, what is he going to provide for me? What value he's going to provide? And I'm going to provide value right now. I use this app called Tiller. Okay. It's tillerhq.com. You have a referral code, but forget that. You can get a daily email of whatever transactions came across all of your purchases on multiple credit cards in a single email. That's the way I use it. They have other advantages. They have something that will pull all your um, transactions into an Excel file so that you can manage it that way. Really cool. Then there's an app called Rocket Money. It used to be called Truebill. If you have subscriptions and you don't even know what you have, but you want to pull them all together, it will go through your credit cards and tell you which subscriptions you have. You can actually try that out for free. If you need to sit down, you and your wife, you and your husband, or even just you, if you're not married, you can visit livingsmarterjewish.org. They will set you up with a financial advisor that will go through your budgeting. The reason I'm giving you these three tips is because you listen to the outro, and I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start giving you a reason to listen to the outro, more advice, this is not advice. Speak to your financial advisor. I'm done. Yago's laughing in the background. Until next week, keep your money kosher. I'm Ellie Langer, and I'm out. Living L'chaim.